like we had all of our own meat, so like to buy a steak in a grocery store just seemed weird to me. Uh, I thought like, why would you buy a steak in a grocery store? There's like, there's tons of meat in the woods, you know? Like, why would you do that? The rope is free! What? The rope is free! Ah, shit! Liam's fallen into a crevasse, and I immediately thought he's dead, or at least seriously hurt. And my guts had been ripped out of my body and were being contained by my flight suit. I know a mountain lion is on top of me. Jody Hines, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks for having me. I'm really psyched. So we're going to get into your backstory because I think it's a very unique backstory and I think it'll lay precedence to the rest of what we're going to talk about, which is survival tactics, survival training, survival methods. You were basically raised in this environment, correct? You're from Newfoundland and until the age of how long were you living off of the land? Yeah, well, like I was 13 or 14. I mean, we grew up subsistence lifestyle. So my grandfather was a fisherman. And we had our own gardens and our own, we call it a hobby farm, but it was a subsistence farm. So my grandma shared sheep and carded wool and knitted wool mittens and sweaters and socks and all that type of stuff. And we lived mostly off the land, which most people there do. We'd go to town maybe like once a month, you know, for, uh, for tea bags and flour and sugar. They call it rough grub back then. And molasses, that was a big thing. But for the most part, yeah, we lived, we lived off of the land and, uh, I was at least 13 or 14 and then well, things got a bit easier and we, we got better I guess amenities and then uh, you know we start going to town a little more we had paved roads and people start getting cars and stuff in the village I grew up in so uh, we kind of transitioned but even mostly till today like today most of my uncles still fish and moose hunt and stuff and smoke a lot of their own uh, their own meats and stuff so it's still pretty uh, pretty heavy tradition so where in Newfoundland is this uh, this is the west coast of Newfoundland on the Port of Port Peninsula yeah. It's near a town called Stephenville. So I don't think most listeners know much about Newfoundland. Like what kind of landscape is it? Is it tundra? Yeah, well, they, they call it the rock for a reason. Uh, it's very rocky. Uh, as far as vegetation, there's a lot of high winds there from the Atlantic Ocean. So you see a lot of like, for example, where I'm at, they call it the Long Range Mountains. And uh, I think the highest point is maybe 2,500 feet. We call them mountains, but it's not, it's not, not like the mountains where you're from, but we call them the Long Range, there's part of the Mount, Long Range Mountain chain. And uh, so there's a lot of high winds. So there's like a kind of like tundra alpine type, you know, style of vegetation up higher because of the high winds. There is a lot of rock. I live right on the ocean. So for vegetables, you grow mostly like carrot and turnip, potatoes, things like that. There's not a lot of uh, green leafy stuff, but uh, there's still like, you know, a lot of blueberries and strawberries. Uh, there's uh, obviously caribou and moose and a lot of rabbit, a ton of fish, of course, in the Atlantic. High winds, rough seas and uh, cool temperatures. Now, when you say you like you live off the land, are you mostly living off of ag agriculture or these caribou, like you're saying, or moose? Yeah, or? so it was kind of more seasonally when I was growing up. Like my grandfather fished all summer, so we we relied heavily on fish and stuff. And like when we were really young, like when my grandfather was growing up, they never had fridges and stuff. So you didn't, you know, you ate mostly fish and uh, you know potatoes throughout the summer. Then as the fall, it got cooler. You know, by the time moose hunting season and or you slaughtered your pigs and stuff. Obviously, when it got colder before refrigeration and stuff, we had cold cellars where you'd dig into the side of a hill and you'd put all your root vegetables in there. Or you can hang your moose in, you know, in a shed and stuff, right, to keep it preserved. Uh, my grandfather did a lot of salting as well. Like, this, like Newfoundlanders have a lot of salt beef because in general, they, it's a tradition because before we had refrigerators, they salted beef to preserve it throughout the summer months. Mm. So that's, that's a tradition that still carries on today. A lot of Newfoundlanders still eat a lot of salt beef. And of course we had gardens in the summer, so most of that would last you through the fall and winter. And then, you know, when the winter came and then there was always rabbit and, and kind of like small game like that, duck. There's a lot of sea ducks as well. So yeah, it kind of just, it just went seasonally, you know, based off what was available, what, what you ate more. Yeah. You have a Native American background? Yeah, yeah, okay. Native Canadian. Yeah. Native Canadian, that's right, yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. And which, is it tribe? Are you associated? Yeah, so that's interesting, actually. Uh, so the whole west coast of Newfoundland in the 1500s, 1600s, the Mi'kmaq people in Nova Scotia, uh, the Mi'kmaq and the French, of course, had a relations. And then when the English came, uh, the, when the English and the French start their fighting, you know, their wars, uh, a lot of Mi'kmaq people and French people went to the west coast of Newfoundland. Mm -hmm. So you'll hear of history books talking about the west coast being the French shore of Newfoundland, but it's actually the, the French and Mi'kmaq shore, I guess you could say. So uh, I think in the last five to 10 years, we're actually starting to revive a lot of the, the road signs and stuff. So it's, uh, 
Where I come from on the Port-a-Port -Port Peninsula, it's a French Port-a-Port. -Port. I'm not mm -hmm. even going to try to pronounce it properly. But uh, the band that I belong to, Benoit's First Nation, they call it Kitbu, which means eagle. So there's a lot of mix between French uh, and native, and there is some English mixed there too. So depending what what line you come from, there's a you know we're kind of a mix between those uh, different cultures. So what was your family speaking French or, or uh, English? In mostly English? Yeah, mostly English. Uh, we live next to the French village. My wife actually comes from the French village. And uh, in the recent years, the Mi'kmaq language is starting to revive as well. There's been a lot of good online courses and stuff, and people are trying to bring back the language for Mi'kmaq people as well. Mm. This is not a reservation? This is just a village? No, it's not a reservation. Uh, a lot of the French and, and Mi'kmaq people from, from Nova Scotia fled and went to Newfoundland in the 1600s, and they settled around uh, the West Coast. And uh, so it's mostly bands there. Oh, cool. And so what's the culture like as far as living off of the land, off of the resources, going to town so much less frequently than the average person goes to the grocery yeah, store? I mean, to be honest, growing up, you never really noticed it. Like, I didn't know. Like, I mean, I, I tell some of my friends at work, I'm, I've been in the military for 25 years. And I, I always think I remember leaving home. We, we like we had all of our own meat. So like to buy a steak in a grocery store just seemed weird to me. You know what I mean? So I, I don't know, like I didn't. Like, why would I've thought, like, why would you buy a steak in a grocery store? There's like, there's tons of meat in the woods, you know? Like, why would you do that? You, you grow up that way and you just don't know any, any other way. So, it, it, I don't know, it just seemed natural. It seems more weird to, to the process that we go through now to get food to me. Like, it seems a little more strange than living off the land, if that makes sense. Yeah. I guess to answer your question, what was it like? Like, I don't, I don't know. It, it felt really real to me. I've, and I missed it a lot. Uh, I, when I joined the military, I've been, like I said, I've been in the military 25 years and, I got away from a lot of that tradition, and in the last five years, I've been getting back to it. That's why, like I was, I was telling you, you know, before I started trapping again and hunting again and fishing again. I'm not a, a food expert, but everything you hear about, you know, online and the stories you hear about the food and what we don't know what's in it. I don't know. In general, I think it was a really healthy lifestyle. Like it just felt good. Like you worked for everything, and people knew their job, and everyone kind of pitched in, did what they were supposed to do. I'm not sure. It's, it's kind of hard for me to answer that question. I don't know. I think you answered it really well. One of the questions I'm wondering about, like, what about nutrition? You were living off of pure food that you guys either grew or yeah. hunted. Did you feel less healthy or more? No, like I actually analyzed that today a lot because I do a lot of athletic stuff and I'm, you know, I've read a lot about sports nutrition over the years for, you know, Ironman training, ultra running and stuff. And I always wonder where we got our antioxidants and, and that from, you know, but then I remember like growing up, like we had a lot of blueberries, a lot of strawberries and a lot of it was frozen for winter months. We had cabbage which it's a pretty good vegetable. Like most of the vegetables were like carrot, cabbage, uh, turnip, and potatoes. But when you look at the nutrient content, like there's a lot of good nutrients in that. And, but I think a lot of it where we got a lot of our antioxidants now from, I think like the blueberries and the strawberries. But as far as the transition, I mean, like it, it happened so slow over time that I don't really, you know, I don't really notice it. I mean, like I said, when I was about 13 or 14, we started going to town more. So the transition was so slow that, I don't know, it's not like there's any defying definite moment where I thought like, oh, like, you know, wow, TV, you know what I mean? It wasn't like that really. It was, everything was kind of slow, but okay. I can, I can still remember like when I, we got our first VHR or VHS in the community, VHS, yeah. Yeah. like one guy had it and you'd rent it on the weekend. And then, you know, uh, then eventually we got one and believe it or not, back in those days, like a VHS man was like 500 bucks. Yeah. Like, is that, yeah, is yeah. that crazy? Do you ever think about that? Well, here's a crazy thing. <laughs> I, I recall going, I was in the Coast Guard, right? And our boat had a port call in Adak, Alaska, off of the Aleutian chain. It's this little island way yeah. down there off of the Aleutian chains. And it's an abandoned military base, just all deserted housing, right? These nice houses, but it was abandoned in World War II. So we walk to the grocery store. We're like, where's the grocery store? They're like in the old high school. And we're like, okay, that's a little weird. Walk in. The whole high school is just lit up with pretty much 120 watt light bulb in the middle. And we're like, okay, this is weird. We walk down the aisles and the aisles are almost empty. There's one can of beans and that's like $5, right? And we walked to the end of the aisle and I think it was like new item. And it was like a CD Walkman. And this is in 2013 or something like that or 12. And we're like, how is this the new item? And we look at it and it's, I don't know. It was like $200. It was ridiculous money and then we saw vhs too it was like the new movies that just got there and they were they were selling them at like for one vhs like 50 something ridiculous and i was yeah. just i remember thinking to myself like yeah it's just the, it's the access i don't know i guess the shipping costs and everything but yeah so you guys did you have a fridge as far as household appliance goes so by the time i was growing up 
Yeah, we would have had a fridge. Like, I can remember at least like six or seven, we would have had a fridge. Like my mom's era, for sure, they never had fridges, you know. I remember just as just after I was born, they got like, uh, it used to be gravel roads. They had roads and they got power and stuff in. But I remember like my grandma telling me these stories about before there was roads and they never had electricity. Like it was really, and she'd tell me all these stories. I was very fascinated by that, you know. It was really cool. So I was kind of in that transition. But, you know, I still remember my like my grandma making her own bread. And I remember she used to bake this, it was called blood pudding. You ever hear blood pudding in the store? No. Like it's actually called blood pudding. You could buy it in stores, but like, you know, when, you, when you'd slaughter the animals in the fall, uh, like sheep and, and pigs, like especially sheep, they'd take the blood and mix it with onions and stuff and flour and like bake this like blood pudding. And uh, I, I've thought a lot about it. You know, like you look back, even like internal organs, like we ate a lot of liver growing up because apparently mm. like it's high in iron, you know, so you eat yeah, a lot yeah, of liver. Yeah. But yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. I, I think a lot of the stuff I took for granted, like as I grew, like, I mean, it's very modern there now, right? Very civilized. Not that I was ever uncivilized, but I mean, it was just a different way of living. But I look back at those times and I, I, I mean, I'm just drawn more and more like to go back to those days, you know, like, I mean, it's uh, it's very interesting to me. And a lot of it's lost, you know, a lot of it's lost. Like, how do you cure meat again? How do you tan hides? How do you, you know, all this stuff is, is kind of a lost art. Which would you say is still an important art? I feel like it is even in modern era. Oh, I, huge. I mean, like I, I trap right now. I have a trap lined up north the last couple of years. With the trapping, that's what we're mainly doing it for. We do it like, well, I do it for the meat and uh, for the pelts. And we're still like, you know, as trappers, we're still like, Fleshing it and uh, drying the pelts, and there's here in North Bay, they still have a big auction every year. They have this huge auction where we sell all of our furs. It's super old school. Like a guy comes around with a truck, you pay him your ten bucks, and he takes all your pelts up. And there's an, an account number associated with it. They have a big auction, and there's a lot of countries that are still using uh, furs for, uh, you know, for clothing. Mm -hmm. And I have some mitts uh, or some, yeah, some stuff that I'll tan up. I'll keep it for tanning, and you can make mitts and stuff and hats, and it's it's kind of neat. Yeah. Yeah. Briefly explain how you store food. You were talking about like back in your grandma and grandpa days, storing it. You dig it. How deep in the yeah. dirt do you have to do that to so preserve? If you're, if you're an avid hiker, a lot of times you'll come across these old like ruins, like or these old homes and foundations, and you'll always see like not far away, like dug into the side of a hill, kind of like they call it a a cold cellar. Yeah. So like wherever there's a kind of a hill, you'll see like this thing that was dug into the hill, and a lot of it like you'll see like rocks, or you can build it like basically. You dig into the ground, uh, you keep it obviously covered with a, like in the old days they use rocks or they use, you know, wood. And it's basically like, looks like an old school outhouse or something that's dug deep into the, the soil. And so for all your root vegetables, like your potatoes and carrots and put them in there to, to preserve it because it keeps it cool, right? So before you had refrigerators, that's what you did. How long? Well, we used to harvest our, you know, our crops in September. You're like, you'd still have stuff throughout like right into January and February. And I remember it was weird because when it was super dark, if you ever put potatoes in dark, like it's got like this, it grows like these really weird white, you know, stems that come up. Right, right, right. Have you ever seen that? You no, know, but a, I know I've heard of that yeah. happening, yeah. Yeah, so root cellars were pop popular to keep your vegetables cool, especially in the, in the summer months. If you had some vegetables that were, you know, harvested earlier, you didn't want to spoil. So you'd put it in a root cellar and keep it cool. That's, that was the main idea. And then salting is huge in the East Coast, like Nova Scotia, all of Newfoundland. A lot of people salted meat, especially because you can salt your fish um, <clears throat> throughout the summer months because you can't preserve the fish unless you smoke it, dry it, or salt it. And that was very common as well. You'd, you'd fillet your fish and you put them out on these big flakes on the, down by the, sh on the shore, we call it. And you put them out on nets and then the sun would bake it and you'd dry it so you can have dried fish. Mm. Does that take away a lot of the protein? Which is the best as far as like preserving no. all the nutrients in your, your meat? I, I think probably either drying it, I would say probably salting it maybe. I don't know the scientific answer, but drying it basically is like beef jerky. So I, I don't think any nutrients goes away. We'll start with the drying. So okay. you, if you put it out in the sun, does that not accumulate bacteria or if it's hot enough of a day, it's it's quick enough where it dries it? Yes. It's okay. So it has to be warm weather. Like, so you have a, a hot sun, you, you lay out your fish, on it, like you open them and you literally lay them out for a couple of days. You put them out in a day and you bring them in at night. And it literally dries it out, like uh, because there's so much salt in the fish, it's salted. The salt helps preserve it, and then the sun just bakes it. So it's, it's almost like beef jerky. Could you do that with freshwater fish? I don't know, to be honest. Uh, that would be a good question. I, I would say if the sun is hot enough, you could. Okay. As long as you keep the flies from laying the eggs on it, right? So you just gut it, 
leave it kind of open, but the flesh all on the bone, and you just leave your fish out on the So lock. they would fillet it. They would make a fillet okay. so it's open, and yeah. then the fillets are about that thick, right? Yeah. And then you dry it, yeah. Okay, okay. And you, could you do that with a bigger fish, though, you know, when it starts to get to be two inches or three? Codfish, like my uncles were doing it all with codfish, right? Okay. So they were getting bigger fish, and they were drying them, to, but they, you know, I think, like, they cut the fillets, like, at a, at a proper thickness, you know? Okay, so you would want it thin yeah. if, you're, if you're drying your, your food out. Yeah, I mean, I would imagine if it's that thick, you're not going to dry it too well, but it was thinner fillets that they were drying their fish with. Yeah. And then I guess the bigger portions, they'd salt, right? Yeah, yeah. Because I want this podcast to be, all right, say you're stranded somewhere, and for some reason you need oh. to be there and survive for a while. I want I want people to pick up some tips here as far as, you know, if they did catch things. If you're definitely anywhere in the Atlantic, or even if you're, uh, I mean, listen, people eat fish raw, right, all the time. Right. I mean, if it's fresh. I mean, and uh, as far as worms and stuff and fish, like really, I think like seventy percent of the worm the world eats insects. It's not going to kill you. You know what I mean? As right. long as you don't. So I, I think as long as it's not like a parasite or something. But I think in general, um, if you if it's a, you're in an environment where it's sunny, and Newfoundland wasn't that sunny, and we did a lot of dried fish. So you put it in the sun for a couple of days. You take it in at night and cover it. You put it out when it's like at the you know brink of the sun. You let, let it dry out for four or five hours and I mean I was a really little kid right when this stuff was going on so a lot of these things like there's some things I can still remember but a lot of these things like every time I talk to my uncles I'm like I knew it happened but I never always remembered the process or the little details so I'm always asking questions now like hey yeah, how yeah. do you do this how do you do that you know yeah why do you cover it at night well a I'm guessing so animals don't get to it too and it's no longer in the sun but what's what do you mean you cover it no you just take it in and cover it up right I mean okay. uh, you just you would stack them on top of each other, put a cloth over and bring it in. Cool, cool. Just to keep flies or insects off it and you put it back out the next day. What's the salting process? Okay, so salting, actually the salting process is very similar to what I do for my hides for uh, for tanning. So my, I remember, and it was funny, I was doing a brine just a while ago. I was doing some uh, tanning of hides and I was remember like, I wonder how much salt. And I remember my grandfather used to take this egg, you take an egg and you put basically your salted water and you mix it. And you put an egg in, and when the egg like floats, like it's kind of buoyant, that's when you know there's enough salt in the water. That's how that's how we used to do it. So he would <clears throat> put the salting, pickling salt, he'd pickle, 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 and he'd always have this little egg in a big, like five gallon bucket. And then when it would float on its own, it's like, okay, that's good. And then literally you'd put the fish in, and then you put some rocks on top. And you'd salt between the fish and you put some rocks on top. And what that does is it makes a pickle or a brine. Wait, so sorry, is it, this is salt and water? Is that what we're Yeah, talking? just water with salt. Uh, so you start with water, yeah. you pour salt, you keep mixing it in in, a, yeah. in warm water, yeah. and then he would test it with an egg. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when an egg is buoyant, that's enough salt really to keep it, you know. That's so cool. And then you, you literally put your fish in the water mm -hmm. and you put like a rock or something on top to keep it squished down on the bottom. Yeah. And then that creates a pickle. And I remember like they'd have fish like that there for like months in a bucket and you just go get, you know, you take it out and you put it in and Literally, you had salted fish and you boil it up and eat it with potatoes. And it doesn't rot in the water being in there? For no, something. not when it's salted, no. So this is, again, a gutted fish, but yes. is this one on the bone or in, or is it filleted? Filleted or you can, uh, you can filet or you can open it because you can cut the head off and, and split the belly, take all the guts out and open it up, right? Okay. Yeah, yeah. You know, and then you can preserve it that way as well. So if the bone's on it, yeah, it was fine, like even in the bone. Yeah. As long as the intestines and stomach is out and the head's off. Yeah. Do you recall, maybe this is like a pretty non-hunter question, but do you remember killing your first animal? Huh. I do. <laughs> That's kind of a funny story, though. I don't even know if it's appropriate. Uh, Good. Let's, let's hear it then. <laughs> oh. One of the first uh, things I remember actually is rabbit hunting with my grandfather. Like I remember hunting rabbit. My grandpa taught us, right, when you when you got a rabbit in a snare, sometimes it's it's alive. So you have to pick it up and you have to, you know, you want to uh, dispatch it, you know, humanely and quickly. Well, we're with my cousin and my cousin was younger and he started panicking and started punching the rabbit. My grandfather got so angry, you know, because you're going to bruise the meat. He goes, that's not how, you know, that's not how you do it. But... But I remember uh, rabbit hunting with my grandfather and my uncle, and that was kind of the first kind of hunting I, I started when I was young. I wasn't very old, mm. probably eight or nine. And then we would go moose hunting. I think there's there's issues with uh, combining people that claim they're like animal lovers, and then, so yeah. they have issues with hunting or whatnot. And But it, it's still 
I still have that curious question of like when, when you first got that rabbit and, and it wasn't quite dead in your noose, was there a little bit of hesitation that you could call as far as like feeling, I don't know, something before executing the rabbit? I think there always is because even till this day, right, there's times when I get animals in my, uh, you know, in my traps and I have like really good kill traps and there's still times today when I catch, when I get a coyote in the snare and you have to dispatch it. I think if you're hunting or you're living a subsistence way of lifestyle and if you're actually getting your jollies out of like killing animals like this, I don't know many people like that. I mean, that's not never the intent. You always hope that you get a good clean kill and that, uh, you know, it's humane and it's fast. Yeah. So. Even today, there's always something inside us like, oh man, you know what I mean? Um, uh, yeah, yeah, there's always something that, you know, I mean, you, you do it because it's food for the table, but at the same time, you, you want to be humane. And and uh, I remember when I was young, like it was hard actually, the first few times, like you just, I don't know, it just was against your instinct, you know, to kind of kill this cute animal. But at the same time, at that time, especially when I was really young, we were relying heavily on this for food, right? And the funny thing about that is there's a whole environmental aspect about that too. You mentioned about, uh, you know, a lot of people, you know, are animal, and I can respect, you know, I have friends that are vegetarians and stuff and I have really good conversations with them about these topics and they respect my, you know, my, uh, my ways and I definitely respect theirs. But I explained to them, I know when I did my trapping course here in Ontario, they talk a lot about the management, they call it uh, like wilderness management and how important it is, like for, especially for the beaver population. Uh, the Ministry of Natural Resources here, we take about 30 to 40% of the beaver population each year, and that keeps them healthy so that well, they're not <clears throat> damming up a lot of roads. And most importantly, if they get overpopulated, they get uh, a disease called tolremia. So that's where you get spots on the liver. Mm-hmm. So that's one survival thing you can, you know, we can let people know. Any animal that you uh, kill for food, you should always check the liver. And if they have white spots on it, well, then you, you want to stay away from it because they probably have uh, disease. How do you know to identify the liver. Yeah, when I open up all my animals, I take out the entrails and I just look at, it's pretty easy to see, like it's on, you know, on the one side and you just kind of take it and you look and if it's nice and pink and healthy looking, you'll notice if there's big like kind of white spots on it, there to be obvious white spots, then you don't want to have nothing to do with that, that, that meat, right? Okay. But if it's healthy and pink looking, you know, next time you're in a grocery store, anyone that's watching this, you know, they can go check out a liver. Like people, they still sell liver at a grocery store. Mm. You can get an idea what liver looks like. Yeah. Uh, and you know it's just it's high in iron and it's a it's a really good organ actually I think for for nutrition. But, and what's that uh, disease called when they have that? I think it's called tolremia. Okay. Tolremia, yeah. So even with muskrat populations, right? If they get overpopulated, they get tolremia real easy. So one of the conversations I try to have with my friends that are vegetarian is uh, well, first there's usually three reasons why they're vegetarian. It's usually environmental, uh, ethical, or for dietary reasons. And I usually have conversations about that. But I mean, in terms of environmental. From what I can see and what the science shows, is like it's actually it's actually pretty good to, like we're not above, you know, we're not below, we're kind of a part of the ecosystem. So I know in terms of even just the beaver management, it's actually really healthy for the beaver to trap and uh, and harvest them. So with beaver, like we harvest their fur, I eat the meat, and they actually you can sell the castors for perfume. They put them in women's perfume. So there's not much, and the tails the tails actually a really good survival uh, thing to eat. A lot of good fat in the beaver tail. So beaver is a wonderful animal to harvest. So I think it, it's cool. You're, uh, you're a SAR tech as well? Yeah, I'm yeah. a search and rescue technician. And uh, we interviewed Gregory, anybody that wants to check out that interview where we talk about more the process of becoming one of these search and rescue technicians in Canada. Uh, that's on the Rescue Swimmer Mindset podcast. But I think it's cool because one of the things we talked about is that your initial training, your selection process, if you will, mm-hmm. is very survival based. Which, yeah. you know, us as rescue swimmers, it's not really the case. We're technically aviation survival technicians, but the survival part of our duties are pretty minimal. It's really through your water confidence and your ability in the water. Mm-hmm. So you going through that first initiation phase, did you crush it? Did you did you fucking kill that phase? Because yeah. that's your expertise, you know? It, I mean, uh, we call it... You know, there's a lot of motivational training. So it's about 15 days in Alberta, in Jarvis Lake area. So I think from the outdoors perspective, like I didn't, it didn't bother me. I just felt like I was home. I was very comfortable in the woods, but the motivational exercises in between brother, I'm telling you, it was like, there was a lot of challenges. And I, I think I lost like 16 pounds or something. There was guys that lost, you know, 20 pounds. What does that mean? Motivational? <sighs> there's just so much stress positions and just full on belt fed, 
you're getting it, right? Because it's, it's a selection process. <clears throat> so the idea is they want to weed out, like they want to really test you. The field portion I really enjoyed. Uh, didn't bother me at all, but they did challenge. They did make it challenging because we were running everywhere and doing push-ups, and you're up for hours on end without much sleep. So, right, right, right. Yeah. But as far as the whole, because what what are parts of that? Don't you have to efficiently snare an animal during that phase? Well, during the last three days, you do what's called a single man phase, and uh, so you're by yourself, where you have to give you like a little container with your, you know, uh, as your bucket for boiling water with your stuff inside you have to go through your survival pattern which is you know first aid fire uh shelter then you do your signals food and water last so you have to put snares up and stuff but one of the issues was that is that they use the same place every year and so year after year they kind of like they shift it here and there right but i mean it's being used so much year after year that man like out of maybe 12 guys that finish one guy might get a rabbit eh? so you're you're literally three days eat drinking labrador tea eating rose hips hoping you're gonna get a squirrel or a rabbit. But uh, I didn't get any on mine because they're just, you're put in this one little area and you're told not to leave. You know, it's a part of the part of the process. Right. And they don't want you at, interacting with anyone around you. So you're alone for three days where you're going through your survival pattern and you, you set your snares and stuff in that tiny little area. <clears throat> but you know, the chances of, uh, you know, an animal coming into your tiny little area is not very good really. Right. You know? What were the things that you're saying you were eating? Rose hips. What is that? R- rose hips is a tiny little red. Uh, you can Google it. Like rose hips got a lot of vitamin C. Mm-hmm. So rose hip, it's a rose hip, and it's a little uh, kind of like a berry looking bud. Okay. And it has as much vitamin C as like three oranges. And then Labrador oh. tea. Uh, we drank a lot of Labrador tea. There's a lot of nutrition in that as well. Maybe I'll put pictures up on yeah. YouTube. That's cool. Yeah. But that said, you know, again, I want to have tips for folks, but it's kind of like I, I wouldn't want to necessarily put this picture up and people just run off into the woods because that's that's the issue with picking or or, you know eating off of the land from what i've understood or learned is you really want somebody to show you like it's something to have a book with a lot of good pictures and descriptions but even then i've come to hear that usually the best trial and error or not no error is the goal is to just have somebody that has eaten it multiple times and is, yeah. is fully familiar with what it is. is that I fair? think that's the safest thing to do. Yeah. Because for example, with Labrador tea, there's another plant out there that looks similar to it, but it has like, you know, there's some, just some different nuances and it's actually not good for you. Mm. So I think, you know, when we do selection, we have people there that show us what the vegetation looks like. And they're showing us like right here, like this is what it looks like. This is what it is, you know, and this is how you prepare it. Um, you got to be really careful when you get these books, you know, at chapters or whatever, and and uh, you, you go try and do things on your own, right? Because you could get yourself in trouble for sure. Yeah. I remember reading one of these books and it broke down if you're in a situation and you have some knowledge on uh, vegetation, you're desperate, you, you're in a survival technique. And correct me if I'm wrong, but basically what he was saying is, I really wouldn't recommend this unless you're in a dire situation, but if you are take the plant you think is edible or looks edible and step one is take it maybe break it a little bit and rub it on your skin wait a couple mm-hmm. hours and see if there's any kind of reaction on your skin yep the second option is you know again break it off or whatever get the liquid and maybe dab a smidge on your tongue wait a couple hours mm-hmm. you know yeah almost half a day see if anything happens then eat maybe a little bit if nothing's happened eat a little bit wait a almost a day if you can and then eventually, maybe if nothing's happening, then there's a good chance you, you might be all right. It, would you say that's fair? Yeah, I think it's fair. I've seen a lot of that literature as well. I think it's fair. I think the best the best thing I can stress to people is just is be prepared, you know. Um, <clears throat> and I mean, we spend money on all kinds of things, man. You know, so to me, uh, I think it's money well worth if you do like a basic first aid course or if you got a basic, uh, you know, survival course. Like these courses, they're not that expensive. And uh I think they're worthwhile, you know, they're worth their weight in gold, right? So, I mean, especially even fire starting, man. Like, mm. we learned a lot of great techniques <clears throat> on course about fire starting. Like, I could start a fire pretty much anywhere in North America right now if there's trees around and, and it works and it doesn't take much, you know, to, to get stuff going. So, let's pretend like our audience here are people that don't do anything outdoorsy, but they've been put in an outdoor predicament. What could we tell them as far as starting a fire? You don't got a match, yeah. you don't have a flint, and you don't have, yeah, a lighter. Yeah, so if you don't have a lighter, a flint, or a match, you, honestly, don't go in the woods. Okay. That's the first thing I'd say. Like, yeah. you know, 
go jump in a river and have a last swim because you probably... <laughs> <laughs> Stay in the woods, man. Like yeah. seriously, yeah. don't go in the woods without. Uh, you know, we're not in the caveman days. There's no need to be rubbing sticks together anymore, right? Yeah. Yeah. But there are people that do that. But with that, though, like think about it logically. You need to have an axe to be able to cut the, the first like foot of the tree. You know, like so. If you got an axe, man, you probably should have a lighter. So I would say just bring your lighter. Then you don't even need an axe. Yeah. And then you know, like any type of. Uh, any type of coniferous tree you know how like christmas trees always kind of they get bigger at the bottom right yeah so when the rain hits them the rain always goes off this way so if you go underneath uh any type of coniferous tree the bottom part the first foot is the driest part because not much of the water gets there so you'll always see these little dry branches like the size of your little finger yeah you know that's where you're gonna you're gonna take all those off and you get a good handful and then you take it and you literally go to the middle you get about you know I'll try like that long, like about a foot and a half is what you break off. Okay. A fistful, you break it in half, and then you got the small pieces on the bottom and the bigger ones on top, and then yep. you can actually get a lighter, and that's how you can start a fire. You can get a, a twig bundle going to call it. The advantage of that is if it's windy, you can go behind a rock or something, or somewhere in the, in, in the shade where you can actually get it going. Does that make sense? So wait, we're not talking a teepee, right? What were we talking about as far as the formation of these sticks you said you just collected from? These the sticks, you do a twig bundle, you literally take this is a YouTube 10, for, for folks that need to, that are listening. So you literally, you understand how we're I'm looking underneath the bottom of a, a tree, right? That like you go underneath because all the water goes off. For sure. Yeah. And you, most people when they walk through is you always see these little dry branches that are about a foot and a half long. Yeah. You literally crack one off. You put like, you put a bunch of them in your hand where like you got a handful like this. So there might be 10 or 12 in there. Yeah. And you know, we're sticking it like this. Yeah. You literally take them and you grab the middle and you could break it right into like this. So all you have is this thing in your, now you got it doubled over in your hand. Yep. Because you broke it in half, you got the small pieces on the bottom and the bigger ones are up top. Does that make sense? As in the It's the just a bundle in your hand. Yeah, but the, the, the tips, because you bent it in half, it's all those little tiny fibers sticking out. Is yeah, you broke it in half. You yeah, broke yeah. the foot in half in half, and now it's like three quarters of a foot in your hand. Does that yep. make sense? You, yep. just, you just took a bunch, right? Yep. So the idea is the reason why you break it in half is because <clears throat> When you break these sticks off, you're gonna have it. It's gonna be fatter at the bottom, and at, at the tip, it's gonna get really thin. The thin parts are what's gonna burn easiest. So when you break it in half, you got all these thin pieces underneath. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'd, I'd go get one for you, but my wife would kick my ass if I brought it in here. <laughs> yeah. So literally, you have this twig bundle, <clears throat> and then you can get a bunch of other wood, put it wherever you want to start your fire. Like if you can said, if you want to make it like a little teepee style or whatever, <clears throat> but you can take this twig bundle and get behind some shelter where it's not so windy and you can start your fire like that. Mm -hmm. And everyone knows like, yeah, you could start, people say, well, I'll use birch bark. And you could, you can definitely use birch bark if you have it. But one of the reasons why we teach this in SARS because you're not always gonna have birch in the area you're in. But generally in a boreal forest, you know, where I'm at in Canada here, like there's a lot of boreal forest, generally you can at least get these types of twigs. So we try to train with the worst case scenario so that we'll always be able to make a fire. Does that make sense? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I pride myself in the fact that, yeah, I'm not very good at many things in life, but I've started a fire in some of the worst conditions, some uh, rainforests that are actively raining, um, in snow areas where there's minimal to no, you know, wood. Um, and yeah, I always emphasize the process of taking your time before you ever even light the match or the strike anything is having the most, what is it? The timber that you call it just having that really prepared, having every time I, I'm in a group environment, I'm like, Hey, can we all collect very small things to start this fire? I think people always skip that and just go to like branches that, you know, it could be the size of this pen, but I'm like, well, we're not there yet. Like we need to get this thing, get it fueled and then we'll, we'll use your twigs, but let's start with some very small things, anything that's going to really keep this flame going. And then we'll, we'll add on and yeah, eventually we'll need bigger stuff and we'll need a lot of it to, to keep, keep it burning. But I think that's, that's something that people tend to just skip over is the taking the time to collect a lot of whatever very small material that's going to burn off of the start. Yeah. So we want spark. You definitely, as you mentioned, you want Tinder and you need smaller from bigger, right? So you, you just covered it. I mean, as far as rubbing sticks together, like you can do that, you know, and, and it's, you could still do it. There's a lot of really, actually there's some cool YouTube videos where you can try that stuff and there's no harm because you're not, it's not like testing, uh, you know, berries and stuff, right? You can't really get in trouble. But the thing that I, I've learned is that you have to have really dry equipment and you have to be able to 
carve this stuff out to make a proper wood to carve it out properly in order to make you know the proper rubbing to get the friction to start to coal and stuff and a lot of those things are pre-made before they go in the field so I, like for me practically i'm like if, if i'm going to go in the field if i'm going to carry an axe to have to do that i might as well just carry like i got like i always got like two or three lighters on me i got yeah. like, my zippo i got a zippo i got like matches so i've got like an old bic my wife bought me this uh i got this tesla lighter this year just to try just to try something different. Have you seen those plug-in Tesla lighters? No, what's that like? It's like an electric lighter. You, you literally plug it in and charge it, and it's got like an electrical current. Um, There's no fuel? Yeah. There's no fuel. You plug it in. I just thought I'd try it, you know, but you have to have it like right into the electrical current. And of course, I was a bit dumb, and I'm like, I, I'm like, like this, I'm like, hmm, where's the heat? And I'm like, I, was, <laughs> I literally saw myself get an electrical current. It's Whoa. different. So, so it's no, there's no yeah. flame. There's no flame. It's just like this electrical current. But you have to put it between whatever you're trying to catch between. So, I mean, it didn't work so well for me with a twig bundle. Like, I like the old Zippo. Yeah. Or, uh, I mean, you can't go wrong with a Zippo, right? Sure. And or uh, even an old Bic, even an old Bic or whatever. Yeah. But I've got a couple of different lighters. I guess my point is <clears throat> I'll carry the lighter and the matches before I, <clears throat> you know, worry about trying to cut down a, a, the, the certain wood to get, you know, the dry pieces to rub together to make it, you know. But that said, this is my scenario here is that we're in, I'm, I'm, we're going to pretend like we're in the movie The Edge. I don't know if you saw that oh, with okay. Anthony Hopkins. Um, it's no, one of my favorite movies. Uh, okay. Except they probably had a lighter in that. It's, it's a plane crash somewhere in Alaska and they have to fight off a bear. People need to go see it as soon as possible. It's phenomenal. Uh, but anyway, let's pretend like you, you just got offloaded here in Alaska. You got nothing. Is it the best thing to do a, a bow drill? Or would it be find some kind of what? What kind of rocks make spark again? Is that is that it's, like almost impossible to find? Shouldn't even bother. Whatever rocks I'd have, I'd try to use it. You know, but I, I know for me, like a bow drill, <clears throat> you could use it depending on the time of year too, right? So in in the summer, you could probably find wood with a bow drill, but you'd have to have a knife to even with a bow drill. The bottom part, the plank, you have to cut a notch in it. That's right. And have a little circle in order to get the bow. Like you have to, you know what I mean? You have to notch it out. So you still need a knife. Yeah. So for people that, that don't know about bow drill and correct me if I'm wrong, but basically a bow drill is you have a string on a piece of wood. Usually hopefully it's carved. Spindle. It's a spindle. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, the spindle is the piece of wood that's going to be onto the plank. Yeah. Right? You got your bow on your yeah. spindle. So the bow kind of, you twist this string. So the string wraps around the bow once. So you got that friction. And then you're going to hold that spindle onto a flat plank, but you've already carved a piece of wood that matches the cone tip of that spindle. And then you also have a V slot to get some kind of mm -hmm. amber. And it's still a, it takes a it's, a, it's quite the process. Yeah. But with that, what would be, if you're desperate, you think you need a fire, what would you say is probably the best technique? Is it that or just rubbing sticks? Because I've done that. I successfully for like, I had nothing to do when I was a kid. I think I was like 13 or something. I went in the woods and just found a nice grooved piece of wood and another one that kind of matched. Like in the winter, I've started fires with dry leaves that come up through the snow near swamps and lakes. Yep. There's always the vegetation that's like dried out. You could even pick a couple handfuls of that. You know, you could probably like roll that up and uh, get whatever almost like sawdusty stuff you need off of that, right? Yeah. They have a, a V cut notched in the side with the hole. And as you're you're drilling, the ambers fall down in between it, like in below it, and they okay. usually catch it on the leaf. Mm -hmm. And that's when they that's when they add that to their tinder. Yeah. What's it like falling through the ice? Oh man. Well, first off, being in a search and rescue squadron, it's not fun because you the number one rule is don't get rescued by your own guys. Yeah, I know. So <laughs> you know what that's like, right? Yeah. As a rescue swimmer. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's funny, well, I mean, I, I've fallen into water. I mean, growing up when we were kids in Newfoundland, we jumped from ice clamper to ice clamper. That was kind of a game to call it clampering. Okay. And I fell in once or twice, and I was like, I was like, oh man, you're you're like, oh, you're like, mom was gonna whip me, you know. But uh, <laughs> but I fell through the ice last year, <clears throat> and man, it like it, again, it's one of those things. Like I, I trap a lot by myself, and I'm I'm generally very very cautious of uh, you know ice but it was getting towards the spring and it was later in the day and i was like well i've been traveling this you know the whole winter it's kind of pretty it's not too bad it ain't too deep but although it wasn't deep <clears throat> falling through like it's still that man i'll tell you the terrifying feeling when you go through and you're by yourself and you're like the first thing you're thinking is like oh man like i i 
like you just get this regret because in your gut you knew you shouldn't have went there but you did and then you fall through and you're like what was i thinking you know i knew i shouldn't have done this that's what's going in your mind right and then the cold shock hits you and then you know we, we actually train for cold shock as well you you can train for it as much as you want but you still get that bit of a panic when you first go through so i went through the ice up to my neck and it was probably minus 15 minus 20 day yeah that was that was uh it wasn't a good feeling I managed to get myself out and I got, I did get up on the shoreline and got my twig bundle going, got a nice fire going and I got myself all uh, warmed up and dried off fairly quickly, but it wasn't a good feeling. And in my back of my mind, I'm like, I don't want to be rescued, you know, <laughs> but at the same time, I don't want to freeze to death either. <laughs> yeah. What's, what's the technique of getting out of, so your feet are in, say you're up the chest. What's the technique to get out of? Yeah. So one of the things we're taught is you always turn around and try to go back to where you came from, you know? Okay, yeah. uh, cause you know, that's the way you came, right? So you try to turn around and go back to the way you came from. And generally, uh, we did some training. There's a gentleman, his name was Dr. Gordon Breesbrook from Winnipeg. They call him Dr. Popsicle. Have you ever heard of him? No, man, you got to check this guy out. He does all this cold water. He does all his own experiments on himself too. Like he gets in these cold water, like he, he, just check him out. Dr. They call him Dr. Popsicle. Yeah. Maybe I'll have Gordon him on Breeze, podcast. Breesbrook. Okay. He's like, <clears throat> this guy's amazing. He's got some cool videos and training videos on uh, hypothermia, and we've used him uh, like we've used a lot of his literature for our medical training as well for like helping patients, hypothermic patients, you know, in, in the Great Lakes sure. and, and the such. But uh, he was saying even if it's cold and if you can't get out, even like within the first minute or two, if you control your breathing, the cold shock will go away. So initially, you got that that shock, but what they train us to do is like you have to kind of stop for a second and start breathing. You got to get your breathing under control. And within a minute or two, like you don't feel the cold. The shock is gone. It doesn't bother you neurologically as much. So what, what kind of breathing are you doing for that minute? I, I do belly breathing. Like you try to belly breathe. You want to concentrate on belly breathing. Uh, most even running a lot of sports, you belly breathe. It activates your, uh, you know, your nervous system where it lowers your blood pressure and heart rate. So you, you try to belly breathe. <clears throat> and uh, the idea as well is you try to go to where you came. Uh, some guys, you know, they buy it like a lot of my ice fishing buddies. They got these little ice picks as well. Like they have them in their pockets so they can, they can kind of get themselves out of the ice. One technique I've heard of is if you have, you can't get out for whatever reason, if it's cold, your arms are wet. If you just let your arms stay, stay still for a little bit, you're like, they say like it'll freeze and you might be able to pull yourself out that way. Right. But a lot of people, if you can relax and you get your hands on and just try to chill and get your feet up a bit and just kind of kick your way out, if that makes sense. Swim your um, way out. Yeah, like swim your way out. I don't know. Do you guys do that type of training as rescue swimmers? I think some do, depending on where you get stationed. Yeah. For the most part, we have dry suits and good good equipment. So the idea is that you're not that cold per se, so you can get yourself yeah. out of that predicament. Um, but yeah, I think that's that's actually something boat folks tend to do in the Coast Guard and different people do. Yeah. We not necessarily did that. It's a whole different process and technique. Um, that said, like anything else, any other tips as far as like cold training? Because you were saying that you Sartex do cold training a little bit. Yeah, well, I know on dive phase we used to do wet shoot. A lot of us did wet suit appreciation day. So uh, you just basically do uh, your morning swim without a wet suit in uh, February, January, February, and uh, in Victoria, <laughs> it's, it's it's chilly. Um, for the most part. Like the rescue swimmers, we have really good equipment for the most part. We have dry suits and wetsuits and stuff, but we have throughout our year long course it been exposed to cold, wet, you know, cold water temperatures. And mostly, uh, you know, it's just, I mean, I, I think unless you train that a lot, like personally, I take a lot of cold showers, you know, uh, like cold showers, I think that's good, you know, like it, it helps. I think it just kind of helps, you know, just being out in the environment and the, ele the elements and being conditioned and acclimatized to that is definitely helpful. But I think the best thing is to control your breathing and try to go out the way you came if you fall through the ice. Okay. I need to do that myself. The thing I, we did growing up, my, my dad always told me, if you're unsure of the ice, he'd always like, there's sometimes, actually it's funny, there's sometimes when I go through some, like there was a couple of beaver traps I was removing a couple of weeks ago and the ice was getting thin and I just cut like this big, like 12 foot pole, like the size of my wrist and I cut cut it down. I'm walking across like this, like it's almost like a tightrope pole. So I knew if I would go in, at least I would only bring up to that, right? Yeah. yeah. So that's a trip. That's a tip too. Like you know that that's uh, pretty helpful. Yeah. Um, and I use a spud. Like I spud a lot when I'm when I'm uh, going into my beaver traps. So like if I'm unsure, like I do some spudding and I check the depth. So a lot of ice fish have been used that as well, right? So again, 
probably good to have some preventative maintenance and uh, if you're unsure, stay off of it, you know? Generally, I'm super cautious. And, but you know, it's always that one time you get caught with your pants down. You're like, man, I, I knew better. Why did I do this, you know? Mm. And I knew it wasn't very deep, but at the same time, I was still wet and I was like minus 15 or something, right? So probably not the smartest thing, but yeah. <laughs> it is what it is sometimes. Yeah. The one thing that you mentioned is, yeah, you felt a little bit of that fear and maybe what am I doing here? I think is what you said. Like, why did I put myself in this situation? And going back to that movie, the edge, I really love one of the mindset aspects that, so they're all freaking out. It's like a group of three and Anthony Hopkins, not necessarily as a survivalist. He's just a rich, rich person, but he reads a lot of books and he's read some survival books. And he, at one point he has a speech and he goes like, why do you guys think most people die in the wild? And they're like, I don't know why. He goes, they die of shame. They don't do the one thing that they could do to save their own lives, which is thinking. And I'd say I've fallen into that pattern, the shame, right? It's the second you get into these predicaments out there, you're like, why did I put myself in this place? I'm doing a recreational sport. This is idiotic. Why do I put myself at risk? Shame, right? And then you you go down that mental rabbit hole. What would you say is good advice? Do you guys do that kind of mindset training as far as survivalist goes? What What do you guys teach as far as the Sartex go for that? We have a yearly, uh, what's called road to mental readiness program. Like every year we do this, uh, it's like psychological training. I mean, it's very basic, but they, they talk about like box breathing, positive self-talk. What's box breathing? So basically you, you breathe in, hold for four seconds, breathe out. Hold for four seconds, breathe in. Hold for four seconds, breathe out. Hold for four seconds. So you just breathe in and out in a box, they call it. So they use that especially for uh, a lot of, you know, parachuting or whatever, whenever you're in stressful situations, they just, they say, hey, just remember, like box breathe, because whenever you do your belly breathing, it lowers your blood pressure and heart rate. Like it's a physiological thing that happens with our nervous system. So that's why it's important to breathe, right? Uh, they have like positive self-talk, you know, visualization is really important as well. Visualization techniques. So, I mean, they talk about those things yearly to keep, try to keep it in our, in our minds. What do you mean by visualization techniques? For example, if you're, we're parachuting, right? If I'm going to be parachuting into just kind of re- mental rehearsals, you know, okay, right. I'm going to be doing this. I'm walking off. Yeah. It's going to go with like, you know, uh, even with coaching nowadays, right? We look at the, uh, positive self-talk when we're coaching nowadays, the, the stress now is on, you know, I want you to do this. I want you to do this. I'd like you to do this. Not, well, don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Don't do that. You know, because there's a lot of psychology to it. And I read a book called Transcending Fear. It's by uh, Brian Germain. He's a psychologist. That's a world-class skydiver. And he explains the psychology of how there's this one tree at a drop zone in Florida. And there's like people hit it all the time. Because people say, don't hit that tree. Don't hit the tree. Don't hit that tree. And the last thing they think about when they're leaving the aircraft is don't hit that tree. And what do they do? They end up hitting a freaking tree, right? So there's a lot of uh, science and psychology around coaching now. Like, you know, I would like you to do this. I would like you to do that, you know, and not don't do this. Don't do that. Don't do this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Interesting. So that's when it comes to comes to like <clears throat> positive self-talk and visualization is kind of they're interconnected. So we look at those types of techniques in terms of especially parachuting, hoisting different missions we're going on. We look at that kind of mindset it's, it's a positive mindset, right? Looking at what you're going to do to get the job done and try not to focus and worry so much and allow the fear to control you where, you know, what if this goes wrong? What if that happens? Like, no, I'm I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this. And contingency plans if something does arise. I like that positive thinking because I I, I don't mountain bike, but I've heard recently that when you're mountain biking and you're going fast down these Russian trails, if you look at the trail, then you'll likely stick to the trail. But if you're looking at the tree that's off of the trail, it's a good chance Mm -hmm. you're gonna hit that tree. Yeah, I thought was pretty interesting too. Yeah, yeah, it's kind of like going back to that one lone tree in the drop zone, right? Right. You're focusing on it. Don't hit it. Don't hit it, and you hit it. Yeah, yeah. It's pretty neat. So I want to I want to do a scenario because we are going to talk about nooses here, and because I think that's a great thing for people in survival technique sure. to know. That said, this, here's the picture, right? We we just crash in a plane. Everyone's dead. There's nothing for some reason. There's no survival gear in the plane or medical equipment. It's minimal, right? All right, maybe you have. In this scenario, we'll, yeah, no matches. I mean, maybe you got a knife, right? And you got you got warm clothes-ish, but you're going to get cold at night. So what would you say is like a, a good 
starter situation? What, which, what's one of the first things that you teach individuals in survival techniques? Mm. So first and foremost, we teach in home the survival pattern, which on land is always the same. The first thing is, is first aid. So you're going to check yourself over, right? Yep. And if you're doing well, that even goes in, in, to continuing first aid. For example, like, you know, when I spend a lot of time in the bush out for more than, you know, a few days, like just even things like brushing your teeth often. Because, you know, uh, when I was on McKinley, I've seen people come to my medical tent. When I was on Mount McKinley, I was the medic there for uh, two summers and they got like blisters on the inside of their mouth. And if you got blisters and you, you know, like your, your mouth is unhealthy, you can't eat, you can't drink, like that's causing big problems. So first aid, number one, you know, um, not just with injuries, but keeping yourself clean. And then the next thing, of course, is fire. Because if you're all alone, you could be in the middle of nowhere. And if you got a fire, all of a sudden, as soon as you got a fire, there's hope. And fire is your friend, it's like you got company. So fire is always the second thing we start. So fire for a lot of obvious reasons, right? Because it really does. Have you ever had that feeling where you're in the, you're in the middle of the winter and you get a fire going and all of a sudden like everything's cool. Like, you know, it's like, wow, you know, it's like your friend and you got this hope and you got this warmth and it's like, oh, it gives you a lot of motivation and want to survive. So that's the second thing we teach. And we, of course, when people are on selection, we show them how to do these things and they practice it. Uh, the third thing is shelter and of course, we're going to select our fire around where we're going to put our shelter. So that's a part of the process as well. But then we get a shelter erected. And then from there, we look at uh, signals. And so we build literally almost like a tripod, right? And we put all these green boughs and we make, you know, these twig bundles. So we have a nice uh, signal fire that we can make. If a plane's flying over, we can catch that thing and all the green boughs. It creates this huge smoke that, you know, you could, should be able to see from outer space, hopefully. Uh, of course, if you're in open fields, you can put SOS or whatever you need to get people's attention from the air. So signals are important. And uh, food and water is generally last. <clears throat> so the idea is that if we were to crash or if we were to, you and I were to go in the woods right now, we have enough fat on us, uh, you know, to last 24 hours. They say even if you got food, you don't eat it for the first 24 hours. That was just, that was the school I came through anyway. You you get your, your you sort out your first aid first. You get your first your fire going. Get your shelter up. Get your signal fire, because within the first 24 hours, that's when a lot of the rescue teams are going to be out looking for you, hopefully, right? As soon as they know it, you're, so you want to be prepared. Food is not the priority within the first 24 hours, because you got enough calories to sustain you, and you want to get your you know, shelter going so you can survive through the night, and you definitely want to try to get to those signals. Mm. So if something is flying over, or there's a rescue crew out looking for you, the priority is to get your signal fire going before food and water. Does that make sense? It does. It does, yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the way we go about it. That's what we teach. And then every situation is going to be different, of course, uh, based on where you're at, what terrain you're in on land. I like what you said about the fire. It, it truly is your friend. And the first episode of this podcast series, Will Detainment, is just me telling my own bear predicament story and mountain lion. But the whole like first part of that was me explaining, yeah, it was all wet. This is in the whole rainforest in Washington. And just being drenched and working hard that was one of the hardest fires i had to start because you know it's just, everything is wet there's no even under the trees and i had to like scrape into yeah. some old dead trees to find some stuff and it's pretty pretty rough but i finally got that fire started and i think i put a picture up of how psyched i was when that thing finally lit so that's it all right so this in this scenario now we're it's going to be a longer longer stay so noose wise yeah, let's, let's talk about that because that's something the PJs are well trained and you're actually training them in, in these these tactics. So, so yeah, so for noose, I mean, I always carry a brass snare wire with me in my pack pretty much everywhere I go. And well, I mean, uh, in most places I'm out, I'm out trapping anyway, so I got a lot of Gucci kit with me. But even at work, you know, I have some snare wire. <clears throat> but I think to start, if you had to make a snare and if you all you had was a boot lace or something, you could literally make a snare with a piece of cord. I'll see if I can because you want to demo this, don't you? Yeah, so if, if people are tuning in on YouTube, we'll try to, or if you're just yeah. tuning in audio-wise, we'll try to describe it as best we can, but uh, this might be a tune-in on YouTube because I think this is a great technique for people to know. I don't know So basically, if this is all you got, this is all you got. On course, we use what's called a, a jam knot. Um, we call it a jam knot because you use less cord and it, when, you, when it pulls tight, it tightens on itself. So we use that for when we're building a, 
like it, it's just a way to maximize your cord. You don't get a lot of wastage. And whenever we're building like poles and stuff across trees, we use jam knots for everything. Okay. But the way you do it, you see like, I like it, you're making a P like for PJ or pararescuemen. Yep. So the P is over the top here like this, right? Then we're gonna wanna go, we keep, we go under this part. Okay. So we've over the first part, under this part, then naturally you're gonna go over this part, right? And then back under this loop that you're in. So it's almost like an overhand, but you start with the P. And when you start with the P, you just start working your way. You go over, under, over. And uh, so this little noose here that you make, if you were, you don't even have to put it very tight, but that's the jam knot portion. So, you know, I'll show you a little, you'll get the idea when I do the brass wire one here, but when this tightens, you see how it tightens on itself? Yeah. It'll tighten on itself and it actually doesn't release as good. It releases a bit, but it, so if you get an animal, if this goes through, you get an animal, at least it'll stay on. Anyone could Google a jam knot, maybe? Okay. But when I'll you, when you make it tight, when you make it tight, the good thing about this too, it's very humane. <clears throat> like before people had like, I guess, uh, fancy wires and stuff, that's probably what they did, I guess, with cordage and stuff or spruce roots. So the thing about it, it tightens. So an animal, if an animal is actually going to be uh, struggling, it'll tighten, tighten, tighten. And then it'll put them asleep and then they'll die humanely as well, right? All right. You taught us the knot, right? But what's the process? You run it, run us through as far as catching an animal. Any animal trails, like, <clears throat> for example, in the winter, it's really easy because you can see the footprints, right? Like, this is just one I got fashioned up. This is a for beaver, actually. This is a beaver snare that I make for trapping or, or fox. And I got little bigger ones for coyote as well. But you watch the run. You look at the run. With rabbits, it's not so bad. This is a, just a 22 gauge brass rabbit snare. A lot of people go 24 gauge as well. So you kind of watch the run. Even in the summer, you can see where runs are. You know what I mean? Like you can see like the trails. And then, uh, so for snaring, it's very, it's much easier with a brass snare because you got like lots of flexibility to wrap it around a tree. So for rabbits in particular, you generally want the snare to be about four inches high. So I go like palm, right? So my palm's like about four inches high and about four and a half wide, especially for rabbits, because sometimes if they touch their whiskers on something, they'll withdraw. So I just make mine, I generally make them a little bit wider so they get, they'll get they get their whiskers through, but they'll actually put their ears down through and get through it, no problem. So if you remember four fingers or four, kind of four inches size, and you get about four inches off the ground. Okay. And then I, you put your a chin lift stick, it's called but halfway up. So you put two sticks so that when they're coming along, there's a chin lift. They see the stick, they have to lift their chin. Mm. Well, this is working out now, isn't it? Yeah, it is. So yeah. then they get they get through and they'll put their ears down to come through. And when they come through, this'll catch them. Okay. That said, so, what are you securing the other end of this noose to? So this, you go around a tree. So if there's a run here, there's a bunch of trees, you literally take this other end and tie it around a tree to secure it a couple of times, tie it off on a tree and this will be like on a run and if there's a lot of space on either side you could put some in the winter it's really easy you could put some twigs or branches around just to kind of funnel them in with yeah. your two with your lift sticks underneath okay with rabbit you can touch this is not bad when you start trapping coyote and, and, and uh, wolf you can't even touch them with your bare hands like i make all my snares i boil them and then i have to uh i, I, I don't touch them with my hands at all i keep them in a bag and then when i put them up i use gloves I have like my special gloves that, so I don't get them scent on it because they'll smell it and then they won't go near it. Whoa. They're pretty clever. But rabbits, it's pretty good with rabbits. You can catch snare pretty easily with rabbits. All right, so you could potentially do this with a shoestring, I guess, if you're in, in a survival situation. You, you yeah, so learn this knot. Because the shoestring is not, wire is not, is very flexible, so it's easy to hang. Like this one, you'd have to play with it and maybe put up like a twig or something. Yeah. You know, like a kind of like a stock or something, you know, to keep it in place if you had to. Yep. I mean, I, I think it would be really hard, you know, to catch animals this way, but it'd be better than nothing, you know? Yeah. I like having my wire in my pack, personally. Yeah. So, all right, so this scenario situation, we learn, what's the knot called again, so we can put it up? Uh, it's called, a, we call it a jam knot in Pararescue. So, yeah, so jam knot, put that up, you funnel the rabbit into this place. Once you've found their trail, you prop it up so they see that they have to lift their head through it. You put it about four fingers high, about the palm or four fingers in the circle. And then hopefully yep. you're, and then you're securing the other end to a, a tree. Sounds 
pretty simple, but you know, it, until you're actually practicing it, I'm assuming. And if you can't find a run, you can always use an open area and uh, rabbits usually eat alders. So you could take a bunch of alders, drive them in the ground, right? And then you could put like literally snares all around if you had to. So they, they run in to get it so you can bait them to come in as well, right? That's an option. Alders. Uh, alders, yeah. What are they? Alders, young saplings, like with, you know, little buds and stuff. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. You know, the little buds that rabbits and stuff eat off top of the alders. Oh, yeah, yeah, the and little alder. things off the saplings. Okay. Am I pronouncing it? Maybe alder? Yeah. They eat small vegetation, like little, off of little alders and stuff. Almost looks like a little tiny pine cone off of a... Oh, yeah, like tiny little little buds on little alders. Yeah, yeah, okay. I'll yeah. put pictures up on YouTube. So that said, like, and as, as far as like morale, if you're so one one show I love to watch, and anybody that hasn't seen it, it's kind of cool. I think it's called Alive. It's a Canadian show, right? These people yeah. they're put into this situation, and it's almost like the Hunger Games. It's like real life Hunger Games. There's no bullshit because they film themselves, <laughs> so they're they're put out there. They have to be good at managing camera equipment as well as surviving off of the land. And the whole premise of the the game is typically they'll drop them off in different places, but a lot of times it's Canada, drop you off in different places. So everyone gets, you know, it, it's it's a little subjective of a game. It's not exactly the most fair because some people get screwed on their location. There's no, there's no food resources or it's cold and it's hard, whatever. It's hard to build a shelter or you're just, you know, on a hill and you're like, well, I got to climb a mountain to get to anything. It's a nightmare. But anyway, the last person to leave wins the game so you don't know you've won until everyone else has quit and it's basically the last man standing or a woman standing it's really fun show to watch because you you see them go through their whole process of getting there they pretty much do what you've just explained you know trying to build a fire and so on shelter and then they really methodically do a shelter and sometimes it takes months most of the times it takes months before it gets to that point that said, what would you say is a good mindset to be able to survive that long? Because these are experienced survival men that still quit within oftentimes the first week or sometimes first couple of days. You know, I think, I mean, a lot of it, you know, you, some people just seem to have it. You know, some people just seem to have it. They have different motivations for whatever reason. Psychologically, they seem to have it. And a lot of these people that are on these shows are very well prepared. So, I mean, I can't stress enough, to, you know, when you're prepared for something, um, when you have some training and preparation, that gives you a lot of confidence, right, in your ability, like with any skill that you do, right? And I think psychologically, like people need hope. You have to have something to hang on to. You have to have hope. You have to have a reason to want to be able to, you know, to come back. So I, mean, I think being prepared, man, like, I mean, you can watch all the YouTube videos you want, you know, but I mean, honestly, you got to get out there. And if, I mean, like I, I spend a lot of time in the outdoors and I still practice my twig bundles and stuff. I still, because if you don't use it, you lose it. I think if you're not an outdoors person and you're going somewhere where you think you might get in trouble, like that's where it's advantageous to hire guides, you know, yeah. like to bring a guide or have people with you or have a solid plan where, you know, this is where I'm going. This is my route. If you don't hear from me by this time, like call this number, this is what I'm wearing. You know what I mean? Uh, these types of things. I mean, I, I can't, I can't stress that enough, mm. but these people are prepared. Does that answer your question? Yeah, for sure does. Maybe we could leave off with, uh, a survival story if you have one. Oh, well yeah i've got a couple survival stories so the thing i will say is no matter how much training you got when shit gets real like it, it it's like uh oh you know the rubber's on the floor now man it's the real deal and that's why it's important to train a lot because there's some scenarios i've been in where i'm like man like no problem like when i when i fell in the lake that last year right i fell through the ice I was like, okay, I, I got out and I was like, oh, it's cold. I'm like, okay, I knew I can get a, a fire started because I light fires all the time. So I lit a fire. By the time I got a fire, it was my friend and I was drying off and I was laughing at myself within like 20 minutes, right? But uh, I did get stuck. Uh, I, I spent two summers in Alaska on Mount McKinley and man, we got stuck in some bad weather up there. And I'll tell you, like, I was scared. I mean, the first year I was like, dude, if I get off this mountain, man, like I'm, I'm never coming back, man. Like in my mind, I was like, oh, this is like, this is no, this is like, the real deal because when you're up there in those elements like try lighting a fire man in a snowstorm you know you got your tent and you and, and you know you, you got your stove and it's like it's man alive like you know so we i got stuck at 17 camp for three or four days can you explain mount mckinley a little bit for folks yeah so mount mckinley is uh is run by the national park service so i went up it was 2007 2008 season i volunteered i went up with the 
So the National Park Service, there happened to be a gentleman there that was a retired PJ, and he, he'd been on a mountain for a lot of years, and he got, a, he got a job. So the way it works is they have two patrollers and then two volunteers. So I went up as a volunteer, and I was their medic, and rescue, like I helped with the rescue stuff as well. So you go up, you do a couple of days prep. Basically, you fly on the base camp. It's at 5,000 feet-ish. And then uh, you, you kind of patrol up to 14 camp, where they set up that's where your medical tent is, and that's where your cook tent is. And along the way, like you're kind of, they're managing their park service people, right? So they're managing, like they're making sure people are following the rules. But if there's any rescues or people getting in distress, like you're responsible for the rescue as well. And then we have a medical tent at 14,000 feet where we provide medical. And then, you know, you can, you can fly patients off uh, if, if the weather permits. So from 14 camp, that's the main camp that you're staying on. It takes about a week to get up there because we're acclimatizing along the way. And then you have to go up these fixed lines and there's a high camp at 17,000 feet where you have extra oxygen. There's this big like thousand foot rope that they use for a lowering s- system. You gotta go up and like, you know, knock that off, make sure it's working and there's no snow on it. And basically at 17 camp, you do your, you know, you, you have a presence there in case there's a, a rescue that's required up higher. So you're kind of there to respond, to go get them, come back and then lower them down rescue gully so that, you know, the guys at 14 can, can handle them in their medical tent and then we can get them off the mountain, so. Mm. Every month, there's like a there's a patrol rotating on, and then as they're rotating off, there's another patrol, patrol rotating on. So you kind of like there's always this cycle of up the mountain, down the mountain with the patrols, and they have about 1,200 climbers per year there. They used to anyway when I was going. So the first year I was there on uh, the last patrol, so it was pretty beaten down. The second year I went on the first patrol, which was awesome because we were the first up the mountain. So it was a totally different experience, but it was really, really cool. Um, but I got, we got stuck, we got stuck with one patient, actually, it was a Japanese fellow climber. Uh, he didn't speak any English. He was up, he got caught up in Denali Pass for about <clears throat> overnight. And then it took like 16 hours to get him down from, from Denali Pass all the way down to rescue lines. And I went up with a team halfway. We put in some, uh, some fixed anchors and stuff with some ski patrol guys. And, you know, when they got him to us, we ended up getting him down to the medical tent. And then that's kind of after all that. That's when my job started, right? Because I was the, I was one of the medics. But uh, his his saturation was so low, and we had bad weather. We had I think we had about I don't know, it was thirty some hours left of O2 eventually. Like we had fifty hours. Weather was bad. We couldn't get resupplied, and we were down to like thirty some hours. So we had him in the tent, and the weather was bad, and his blood pressure was really low, and he was suffering from pulmonary edema. So I couldn't give him the fitipine because one of the contraindications indications for that was low blood pressure. So we end up, I end up putting him in this, it's called an ambu bag. It's like basically yeah, a big yeah. pressurized tube. So like at the same time, like, so we're like, but you got to keep pumping it to two PSI to, you know, you jump, you bump it to two PSI, basically drop some, you know, the partial pressures of oxygen where he's at like 5,000 feet below. And then, uh, so for folks that don't know, yeah, this, this is like a bag that's literally inflated and it's yeah. giving you oxygen that's similar to to sea level or at least not 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 like at the altitude yeah it's a pressurized bag so because there's pressure in there the partial pressures of oxygen in your lungs basically instead of being at like fourteen thousand feet his body feels like it's five thousand feet below yeah. so that helped him quite significantly was with his oxygen saturations yeah and it helped it helped him with his pulmonary edema as well but we were on the mountain for a couple of days now we were in a tent mind you but man like when you're trying to take care of a patient and you got guys like we're rotating through and you're trying to hydrate yourself and trying to sleep yourself and trying to keep yourself going like it was it was pretty uh you're surviving up there and luckily i remember we made a decision the patrol uh, the patrol leader said you know if we can't get a chopper here by this day we got to start taking them down we're gonna have to haul them down and that's a big task you know to drag a guy back down the mountain in, in a snowstorm but uh so we had a cutoff we're like okay at like at like 24 hours of auction that's it if there's if we don't get a clearing to get them out of here with chopper we're kind of dragging them down. And luckily we got up, like it happened to be that morning. And I woke up and like, it was like the sun was out and I can hear the chopper pilot on the radio. Like, yeah, we're like 20 minutes back. I'm like, oh, everyone's just like, yeah, you know, the sun came out, but I got like some of the most gorgeous pictures ever up on Mount McKinley. <clears throat> and it was beautiful and I loved every minute of it. But when the weather got bad, man, I hated every minute of it. It was scary too, you know, like it was kind of, you ever been in that situation? Like we're, yeah. Like, man, this is gorgeous, but then things get real. And it's like, oh boy, this is scary. You know, so like that, the whole month felt like surviving to me. There was storms on and off and it was, it was pretty gnarly. 
Yeah, they always say like the best mountaineers are the ones with short memory, right? Yeah. Because <laughs> um, they keep returning through the nightmare of their their horrific stories. You know? and, and I went back the next year, you know? <laughs> it's funny. I went back next year thinking, oh, this is awesome. Yeah. And I'm like, man, like, but things do get real out there. So, yeah, I mean, I've been in a few different survival situations and uh, the training helps. But when things get real, I, I think, you know, I really like when you talked about the shame portion. Because the first thing that goes through your mind is like, man... Like, I don't want the boys rescuing me. Like, how can I get myself in this position? This is, this is awful. You know, like, I'm not, I'm not activating my beacon. I'm not calling no one. I got to get myself out of this first, you know? It, 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 is, uh, it is quite a quite a thing to think about. Yeah, and I think that's something you need to try to do immediately is try to shed the ego, understand, be present, if anything, right? Hey, this is the situation. Yeah. All right, maybe I was stupid, probably was, whatever. But this is yeah. what it is now. Here we go. Let's take the journey from here, from this yeah, predicament. It sucks, but now let's deal with it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. This sucks. Let's deal with it. And not yeah. to mention a lot of folks that are adventurers or outdoorsy folks. Let's be real. When you are presented that dilemma, that hardship, a lot of times it's secretly what we're deep down hoping for. Like, let's see what, if we can test ourselves, if we can figure out, if we can problem solve and get us out of this this predicament. That's why I was reading all those survival books as a kid. It wasn't per se because I wanted to be in a survival situation, but I wanted, you know, I like the idea of it. If it happened, would I be able to figure this out? Would I survive? I always like that. I, I remember the book Hatchet, right? That classic little kid's book or whatever. It's not kid's book, but kind of is. This kid, plane crash, and he's basically only got a hatchet and a couple, couple supplies and he survives all alone, little kid. I don't know. I always liked the the idea of that and the, just the mindset behind survival. So, uh, yeah, Jody Hines, anything you want to depart as far as your years of wisdom in survival tactics? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, honestly, uh, I mean, you, you got to stay humble about it. You're always learning. No one's an expert. You know, we just we practice these things. And I think the most the best thing I can say is, uh, you know, try try to get proper training and try to do a lot of practice so that if you're ever faced with this situation, hopefully, you know, you, like they say, you know, you trade hard, train hard and work easy, right? You know, that's all I can say, really. Just get the training, man, man, you know, and, and practice it. Hmm. Last concrete example, how do you murder a deer if you don't have the equipment? <laughs> like, out, if you're out there, can you noose a deer? You can snare, yeah, you can snare a deer, yeah. You can take one of these, well, if you take one of these, uh, if you took one of these snares and laid it like sideways on the ground, <clears throat> actually you could put like, if you put like a piece of cardboard with an X in it and you dig a hole, they can actually literally put their foot through the cardboard. And then the cardboard, like because you got an X cross in or cardboard or sticks or whatever, it actually, there's a technique where, cause their foot goes down through and it gets caught around their foot. And then when they try to put their, bring their, their foot back up out of the hole, the cardboard is stuck on it or the, the branches are stuck on it. And then it, it allows the noose to draw tight when they try to walk. So there is a way of doing it. Uh, it's a survival te technique. I mean, you, you, we're not allowed doing it trapping, obviously. Like, it's totally illegal. Yeah. But there is ways that you can do it, yeah. Maybe that'd be another podcast. I don't know. Yeah. Wait, I'm just <laughs> curious. So you cross an X on a board, hole underneath the board. Yeah, so you dig a hole on a path. <clears throat> and I've done examples with cardboard showing the guys for survival. But you can do it with, like, you can use your imagination. You can use it with alders. You can weave alders the same. But if you were to take a, a cardboard, put it on top, you cut your X in like this, right? Yep. So the, their, their foot's going to go through the X, right? But imagine when you put your, your, your hand through that, when you try to bring your hand back up, it's like those, what are those Venus fly traps or something? You put your finger and you can't take it out. Yeah, but with enough strength, so, you could. So how does the noose get this, activated? So what happens is you put the noose around the top of it. And so when they put their foot through, now the noose is around. But when they try to take their foot back up out of the hole, the cardboard is stuck there. So the noose can't fall off the end of their, uh, their paw. It has to stay there because the cardboard is stuck on their paw. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah. So the noose is on top of the cardboard initially? Yeah, and then of course you camouflage it. So when they pick it back up the go, that's what's gonna keep the noose on the paw to draw it tight. Mm. And then the cardboard might fall off after, but it's enough to keep. I could talk all day about all these examples I've read in all these <laughs> literature yeah. books. I remember the, yeah. there's one guy um, who back in like the early 1900s, was in the Appalachian area or New York. He went naked into the woods in New York, literally naked. I don't think he brought anything and he wanted to survive for th three months or half a year or something like that. It was maybe longer, but he 
basically built everything. He built his own clothes somehow or constructed it. And he talks about taking down a deer just by staying put and knowing where the deer was at which time of the day. And he basically just took the deer down with his bare hands and a knife or something. Wow. He probably carved a stick and he was all like up in a tree waiting a spirit or something like that. I don't know. There's YouTube videos of a guy. I, I seen it like where he's like in the brush, like in these, I don't know. It looks like Florida, you know, those, those vines. <laughs> and he's just hiding there. You barely see yeah. him. And then this deer walks by and he hops out of nowhere onto this deer. Just incredible. Like I think with patience. And, he's, he's in it to win it, man. Yeah. He's yeah. It to win it. yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, Jody Hines, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks to Gregory yeah, thanks. for putting us in touch and, uh, until next time. Thank you.